There was no evidence that Governor, that Mr. Noriega was involved in drugs, no hard evidence, until we indicted him. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably, but it was for the good of the system. Oh, we don't mess around other people's elections, too. Another episode of the Rackets podcast. Um, this is going to be part of a multi part series, but today's topic is the explosion of drug production in Southeast Asia, particularly Myanmar. And just go, going to go into the factors contributing to that, a lot, a lot of why that's happening, the history behind it. Um, yeah, so, so let's dig in here. So, what I really wanted to touch upon again, we're going to touch upon Southeast Asia in general, there's a lot of just a massive crime increase that's happened over the last few years. Um, the first topic that we really should start with is it, are the drugs, right? So Myanmar for decades, this has been a problem. So when you look at those numbers, um, Myanmar is, na- is now officially the top producer of opium in the world for many years. And again, these you know, these are estimates. These, ba- these are based upon estimates. So for many years, Myanmar was usually, you know, a far distant second place or third place, but it's always been one of the top producers of opium in the world. It's also one of the top producers of methamphetamines. That methamphetamine market doesn't make its way to the U.S. Usually, it, it's, again, there's a massive consumption market um, throughout Asia, but it's one of the top producers. And there was sort of this perfect storm that that sort of led to the resurgence there as far as the opium production in Myanmar. So I really kind of want to point to two factors. The first factor is that when when the United States left Afghanistan and and really allowed the Taliban to take over, they put in place a a pretty darn firm um, opium ban there. I'm going to kind of go into why, you know, there, there's just a lot of factors behind that opium ban, but it, it really did. Afghanistan, for a couple of decades, while the United States was occupying the country, was by far the top producer of opium in the world. And right around that same timing in the same year, a military coup took place in Myanmar. So pretty much since its entire existence, um, formerly Burma, but Burma, which is now present day, Myanmar, it gained its independence in 1948 from Britain. And there's, again, this issue has been around for decades. Um, And the military has controlled that country to some degree, pretty much for that entire time. You know, there's been these teetering steps back and forth towards democracy, but the military has always had some level of control. And it it went into the extreme back in February of 2021. And there's been a civil war that's been taking place there for a long time. And as a result of that civil war, there are a ton of these different rebel groups throughout the country. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them are funded through, through, through illegal drugs. There are also many other, you know, fighting groups within the country, and I'm going to go into those factors later. But what we really see is that once the once the the coup took place, there's a lot of these fragmented rebel groups. That, that part of how they fund their fight is through illegal drugs, and also the regime also makes a lot of money off of illegal drugs. So this black market is helping to fuel a lot of blood, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of death, a lot of misery throughout that country and throughout the world. It's part of a repetitive theme that you'll see with me is that I, I'm a huge advocate for ending the war on drugs. Um, I'm not naive. I understand that by decriminalizing and legalizing drugs, it's not, it's not as though there's no harm that, that takes place from that. 
But when we look at all of the harm that takes place from keeping these things in the black market, I think it's just, it's a no brainer. It's an obvious decision that we should end these things. But most people are really not aware of what goes into, you know, all of this black market production. And again, all of the bloodshed that goes along with it. So again, to recap, again, 2021 was a real turning point. When the Taliban took over Afghanistan and when the, the junta in Myanmar had launched their coup, right? So when we look at the numbers, again, in December of last year, that's when the UN came out with those numbers and said that Myanmar had officially um, taken that top place. Again, it, for, for decades, it's been really more of a long, far, far distant second place or third place, right? So again, massive opium levels, massive levels of amphetamine production, I want to go into let's look at let's look at Afghanistan for a second. So the Taliban took over back in 1998. And actually, let me, let me pause that for a second. Here's how I view things, and it's very much how it actually really works in the real world. So when you look at very poor countries like Afghanistan, where there really is no central government, the average income in Afghanistan is around the equivalent of 400 U.S. dollars per year, right? So when you have this black market crop that's worth unbelievable amounts of money, what, what opium really represents is power. So historically throughout Afghanistan, again, the central government doesn't have a lot of power. So when we look at there, there are many of these different warlords who essentially really control the country. And again, historically, when you look at that, so many of those warlords are attached to the opium trade historically for decades. It's always been this way. So when the Taliban took over, at some point they were really looking for international recognition. And so part of that was to say, hey, we're going to put an opium ban in place. Multiple reasons. A, obviously, we know it. They have a well-documented record of being a very tyrannical extremist Islamic group. So that sort of falls along with that ideology, right? But what we see is, I just kind of, like, just kind of sort of plant that seed, is that their, their ideology will shift depending upon the circumstances, right? So Mo Omar, back in, back in 2000, did, it, did install an opium ban, and they enforced it. Um, so if we look at the numbers, there were about 3,300 tons in 2000. And that dropped all the way down to 185 by 2001. They were very effective at that because, in my opinion, part of that motivation was that, yes, that is ideology, but more so when the, when the Taliban's in power, they don't want any threats to their power. An oversimplification, but that's pretty much how that works. And again, they were looking for international recognition. Um, they had representatives visit the White House. Again, this is before 9-11. They, they were supposed to get millions of dollars in assistance you know, for that cause. Again, this, this is all we're talking about before 9-11. So obviously, after 9-11, the U.S., we go in there. It's our longest standing war ever. Um, and part of what we did was, obviously, we helped to get I mean, Karzai in power, but Knowing that background, if you look at the history of the Northern Alliance, that was really our, our top ally there, again, opium traffickers. When you look at those two decades while the United States was in power, you can see that there were a number of these, these high-level traffickers who were allied with the CIA, some of them on the payroll. I do like to point out that one of the most obvious ones was the former president's half-brother was <laughs> A well-known trafficker, an informant paid by the CIA. And again, this was all looked at the other way. This was, again, there's sort of a conspiratorial tone when, when I bring that up, and some people think that that's by design, and I do not agree with that. It's just sort of the CIA is going to do whatever they want to do. If the mission is install this certain person, this, this certain group in power and keep them in power, they will look the other way at the drugs. They will help the drugs get out of there. Um, and that's just, there's been a long history of this, right? So once the United States leaves, well, guess what? The Taliban, they take over again, and they issue another opium ban. 
So when we look at the numbers again, massive production as much as 6,200 tons, 2022. By 2023, it's down to 333, about a 95% decrease. Again, because the Taliban, I do think that that fits their agenda, obviously, but more so we, we have to recognize that it's their real intent is to try to take away all of their threats of power. Because while they were out of power, while the United States was occupying the country, the Taliban was making money off of opium. When the Taliban was making money off of opium, it wasn't that they were producing the opium and trafficking it themselves. The, the, the Taliban had control of different parts of the country. And if you, were, if you were an opium warlord in that part of the country and you wanted to be able to traffic drugs, you had to pay taxes, unofficial taxes to the Taliban. So they taxed the drug trade while they were out of power. So again, this is sort of a moral issue for them, but it's not really. Their, their morality on this topic is very fluid depending upon the situation. But now that they're back in power, Afghanistan is no longer this major um, production center for opium. So again, that shifted over to Myanmar. I kind of wanted to kind of go back in time for a second just to kind of give you a little bit of background. So, as I mentioned, this has been going on for decades. So the United States has a, has a big part of that, has a big part in that. Um, so again, Burma, which is again, present day Myanmar, it gained its independence back in 1948. And a couple of years into that, to that run there, the KMT, those are the Chinese nationalist troops. You gotta understand that Mao, Mao Zedong took power back in, at the end of 1949. And that group was who we supported. Obviously, the, the, the anti-communists were who we supported in China, in China. But they fled mostly to Taiwan. Some of them crossed the Burma border. And they were you know, launching different operations to try to, throw, to overthrow Mao Zedong unsuccessfully. But for many years, the United States was supporting those rebel troops. Back in 1950, President Truman authorized Operation Paper that was assisting those, those KMZ troops. Probably, you know, if you really want resources on this, you can obviously read my book. A, a good portion of, of this particular topic was sourced from an absolute amazing historian, Alfred McCoy. He's got two different books called The Politics of Heroin that are an unbelievable resource on this topic. But long story short, the KMT, they crossed the border into Burma. Um, again, opium production already existed there, but I'd, I'd like to give the analogy of essentially the KMT poured gasoline on the fire. And in fact, in many cases, they would go in there and force the locals to work for them. They taxed the trade. And again, they had the United States backing. Opium production really exploded and the size and the scope and the sophistication directly with the with the aid of the CIA there in Burma and really again created a cult the culture already existed but it really expounded it with the CIA support again because they were trying to support I'm not making a moral argument against or for them just trying to state the historical facts that the CIA they assisted the KMT who were trying to overthrow the Chinese. At some point those KMT didn't really that, that mission, at least the ones there in Burma, that just really seemed to fizzle out. And it looks more like many of them just sort of shifted into drug trafficking. Um, and that's really kind of what I want to talk about here is that the Burmese government eventually, they, they tried to fight this. At one point, they, they went to the United Nations and tried to get assistance because these, you know, filed an official complaint because this group, these groups have come into their country, invaded, and, and really created this problem. Well, eventually they sort of took the, the approach that if you can't beat them, join them. And, and what I mean by that was they just took the sort of pragmatic view that we're not going to be able to stop this. We have all of these different rebel groups within our country, and what we'll uh, they more or less say is 
we're going to allow you to be drug traffickers, but you have to fight unofficially on our side to fight these different rebel groups. So back in 1963, the military junta there made unofficial deals with these different militia groups and said, you're, you're allowed to traffic drugs, but you have to help us fight these different rebel groups. And point in there to the two different um, two different leaders there who went on to become some of the world's most prominent drug traffickers in the world. The person pictured there to the right is Kun Sa. What we find is that their loyalty to the government and to outside governments would kind of ebb and flow as well. Um, and it's, again, that was sort of essentially by design by the CIA. They sort of created, created this market, created these different rebel groups, um, and again, that loyalty would sort of go back and forth is what we can see over time. And as we sort of fast forward closer to present day times, met, again, many of these different rebel groups, that that's how they financed their, their war effort. And I'd like to point to the UWSA, the United, United WA State Army, um, that term non-state, that term non-state actor genuinely applies to this group. I would label them as the second largest behind Hezbollah. They are essentially a country within a country. The production of illegal drugs are a massive part of how they've helped to pay for this, this large army. They really do have estimates show anywhere from 20 to 30,000 soldiers. That sophisticated weaponry. Um, but it's also not entirely from drugs. That's what I was not pointing out there. It's kind of odd that this this large non-state actor rebel group, um, the country of Myanmar is the second largest exporter of tin to China, and almost all of it comes from a mine that is in the UWSA's territory. So just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of background on that group. So that start, that group started in 1989. It was a breakaway from the, the Chinese Communist Party there in Burma, and they broke off onto their own. I really like to say that they are really are essentially a country within a country. So if you look there on the map, you can see that they, they have their own unofficial borders. It is recognized by the country of Myanmar, they, are, they essentially have their own autonomous region. Um, they are culturally different. The, the leaders of this group speak Chinese. They have their own roads, their own schools, their own infrastructure, their own army. Um, they do not even speak Burmese. So they are, they are culturally Chinese. And China has a tremendous influence with this group. So those weapons aren't just magically getting there by, by accident. The, you can, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that they get most of their weapons from the Chinese government. And what we see throughout, throughout Myanmar is that China has a tremendous amount of influence. So China helps to arm that military junta, and indirectly China has really helped to arm a lot of these different groups. So the UWSA is essentially like they're the arms trafficker to the other militia groups throughout the country. They are essentially neutral to the Myanmar government. They're not, they're not really an ally. Well, I would say they lean a little more towards an ally than, than an antagonist. But again, they really, because I would say mainly because of illegal drugs that has allowed them to, to get so much power. There's so much profit in these drugs that they've been able to arm themselves to this level of power where the Myanmar government just allows them to have that independence within their own borders. So part of where you can really see so much of China's influence is if you look there on the map, they have those two different um, areas in green. The southernmost region is where China really started to apply pressure because you know, China tries to keep things off of their border. All of these vices, the drugs, the gambling, sex work, the, the, the sex trafficking, the labor trafficking, there's, there's a lot of crime in this part of the world and they really wanna keep that again, away from their borders, 
so none of this this creeps over. So they pressured that group to start to take their 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 base of operations and move it to the southern part that, that's the circle there in green that, that's along the Thailand border. So back in 98, again, the official numbers obviously are tough to get. These are estimates, but it's estimated that about 1,400 villages and 100,000 people were forcibly relocated. They had to move those, those operations there to the, along the region that's along the Thailand border. Um, I don't know if it was China so much that pressured them, but also they made a, a conscious effort to shift away from opium and towards amphetamines. And if you can see there on the, on the bullet points, the precursors, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, but one of the leaders there, he was designated as a kingpin by the United States back in 2000. You see him pictured here on the State Department's website. Um, many of the top, I mean, several of the top leaders have been sanctioned. Again, is, is it 100% accurate? I don't know, but the, the U.S. Treasury Department labeled them as the most powerful drug trafficking organization in Southeast Asia. I would have to agree with that. It's, it's, it certainly seems to be the case. So again, initially more of an opium trafficking organization, now more of an amphetamine tra trafficking group. Um, the form of the amphetamines there, because again, they're feeding more of that consumption throughout Southeast Asia. Throughout that part of the world, it's not really so much of that, that powder form, it's in the pill form. Um, the term Java, it's very popular throughout Southeast Asia. And that's part of why I was saying if it's an American audience listening here, most of that doesn't make its way to, to the United States. Most of that is consumed in that region of the world. Um, but one of the things that's really concerning is that it seems that there has been a shift towards um, towards fentanyl as well. So there was this massive capture back in 2020. So the chemicals were produced in China and they were captured en route to the UWSA territory, 72 tons of the precursor chemical. Now I have no idea how much of the final product that could produce, but I mean, 72 tons uh, for a drug that's as powerful as fentanyl, it's pretty scary. And again, we're talking about a group that, that has so much of this power because of the black market. If that black market didn't exist, it sure seems unlikely that they would get to this level of power. As I mentioned there before, this is a this is a UN report here from back in 2022, and it's sort of a, the heat map charting as far as where the opium production works. We could take a whole lot of time. It would take too much time for this for this one episode. But if we look there, in so many of these different regions, that's where many of these different rebel groups hold their power. Is is where the the drug production is happening as far as the opium. And it's also with these groups that are called border force guards. And that's you know, really what I wanted to talk to you about next. So obviously, you know, the military junta has tremendous power. They have a lot of troops in place there, but these border guard force groups, essentially they're very much like those KKY groups that I was pointing to back in the 1960s, where the government, what they found is they again, made the pragmatic decision there, there are so many of these different ethnic rebel groups throughout the country, and as they grow in powers, in many cases, directly from the result of black market drug production, they get to be too powerful. And the government says, and just sort of makes that unofficial truce agreement that says, okay, if you'll now fight on our side, there's going to be very little accountability for these drug laws in your region of the country. And we, we, and we can see it when we go back to that map. And when you look at it, it's usually border, you know, one of those border groups or one of the uh, one of those rebel groups. That you, and that's really where the drugs are being produced. So when I mention that there's many different rebel groups throughout the country, it's because there's a really diverse population there. I don't want to oversimplify it and make it sound like every one of those rebel groups are funded by drugs, 
but there's a really high number. And again, drugs, it, it is absolutely led to an unbelievable amount of bloodshed throughout this country. Um, again, I mentioned it earlier, there's a civil war that's taking place in this country. There's been horrific war crimes that have been committed throughout the country, just to kind of give a high level picture of what's happening. Um, I believe this report was issued, oh no, this is in June of this year. Um, and obviously it's increased ever since. So remember February, 2021 is when the coup took place. And you have to think about it in these terms. Those rebel groups are very fragmented. Some of them are ally with others. Some of them flip over and become pro-government border guard forces. Some of them that, that, that will flip back and forth. They'll become allies, et cetera. So this has been this very fragmented war. And the military coup, at Junta, has been, they've been brutal, right? So over 5,000 civilians have been killed, over 3 million displaced. Anyone who tries to express their personal opinions about that, that is a very dangerous thing to do in this country at this time, over 20,000 political prisoners. Um, like I said, there's just been, there's been so many different war crimes committed. I'm just kind of highlighting just a few here from Amnesty International. Um, when we look at, I mean, going through, didn't mention there's been over 50,000 homes burned by the regime. Again, if, you, if you're considered an enemy, they, what, they're, what they're doing, it, it's just terrible in this country. This, is a, this was a monastery. They're attacking civilian infrastructure. And again, I don't want to oversimplify and blame all of the bloodshed and, and all of these offenses strictly upon drugs, because that's not really accurate. But I did want to point to this report here by the UN and in many ways how the supply of drugs, how there's sort of this open market, well, you can stop it in one country and then another country tends to pick up the slack so that the supply really never goes away because there is so much demand. Same thing here with these weapons. So it's just kind of a sad state of affairs. So this report shows how more and more news reports have come out about just the horrible things that are being committed by the, the Myanmar junta. You can see how public pressure has put has taken away some of the resources from 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 the military right you see these different countries here this is the prior year of 2022 and many of them have drifted off china you know including china russia singapore picked up most of that slack whereas a lot of these countries from that public pressure stopped providing so many supplies and armament um to to Myanmar, but again, it still keeps happening. They're still committing these, these terrible, atrocious acts outside nations that are helping to support and keep the, the regime in place. In my opinion, obviously China is the most important as far as that, because um, obviously they have helped to prop up the government of Myanmar, but they're also helping to sort of prop up these different rebel groups. In part, I hate to sound cynical, but I do think that, that this is a part of their motivation, if you look, that China does have a number of different Belt and Road initiatives in place in Myanmar. Some of them have been paused due to, to the fighting. But by helping to support those different rebel groups, well, guess what? If you want to build your, your different railroad project, you name all those different infrastructure plans, it, you can, you'll never be able to do it without the support of these different rebel groups throughout the, throughout the country. So China essentially is sort of hedging its bets, supporting really both sides of the war. Um, that does tend to fluctuate with how strong that support is, you know, throughout time. But what we've seen is that it really looks like that the rebels are starting to gain a lot of ground. It, I'm hoping that this war can end soon. Um, even if it ends, I don't see a really positive outlook. Um, again, because you have so many of these rebel groups are really criminal groups there. That many of them are really just organized crime groups in, in many ways. So in October of last year, what we what happened was that they really formed an alliance between three of the larger rebel groups. And the, the military leader was pointing out accurately 
Um, he was pointing out that, hey, part, part of this, this civil war is, again, funded by drugs. He was pointing out, hey, how some, a couple of these different you know, groups, they're, they're clearly tied to drug trafficking. He wasn't pointing out his own. I mean, there's all kinds of evidence that's, that shows that the, that the that Hunter is making a lot of money from the drug war, too. He didn't want to point to that. But again, it's just, I like to, and I'm going to kind of end it on that, on that final point, that when we look at all of, all of this bloodshed, all of, all of these lives lost, all of the misery in this country, a good portion of that we can directly attribute to the war on drugs. Um, I don't want to oversimplify it too much. You, you can look at pretty much any sort of commodity in that country, such as jade. Jade's not an illegal one. You can look at a report from Global Witness that just shows that there's all kinds of terrible human rights abuses and, and just the whole the whole production and the labor standards, et cetera. There's a lot of misery attached to that. But when, when we compare that to, say, the profits that can be made from the drug market, it just pales in comparison. So my dream is the one day where we can end that. Um, I do like the fact that China is building infrastructure in their country to try to create more legitimate commerce in that country and hopefully to reduce some of this bloodshed. Um, yeah, like I said, this is going to be, this is part one of, a, of at least a two-part and possibly three-part um, podcast on on the crime wave that has really increased throughout Southeast Asia. We're going to go into some other issues as well on the, on the following podcast. I'll be on that final note. I just have to say, please support the podcast in any way that you can. And thank you much. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to um, to prosecute. You can have a license. Price is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus a monthly payment of five percent of the gross of all four hotels in the store. Corleone.